Oh, well, a nice small. Just send right in. I <laughs> <laughs> affiliation there. That's what just happened there. If anyone's questioning that, that, that was... Uh, that was Morinsville that was at play just now. Um, Mr Chair, I'm delighted to take a call on Clause 12 because I do need to correct myself from my um, previous contribution. I had a, a slight mismatch there. When I referred to um, James Bellich as an honorary member, he's actually an honorary fellow. But one of the, the points actually that uh, I have outstanding from my last contribution that I'd love the uh, member and the chair to respond to is that I'm still not entirely clear on how the addition by omitting, as set out in Clause 12, um, by uh, uh, changing Section 171B, by omitting science or technology and substituting with science, technology or the humanities, that in practice we will have a different set of honorary fellows included under the Royal Society. Um, and I'd like to demonstrate that point by talking about some of the honorary, mem uh, honorary um, fellows um, uh, currently listed. Because at the moment, in the legislation, uh, and actually uh, listed in more detail, I think you'll find, by the Royal Society um, in their public space themselves, honorary fellows are listed as being those who are seen to support the activities <coughs> of the Royal Society. But they're not necessarily those that we're deemed to be um, uh, unlike, perhaps, the companions and the honorary members. Just, just contained within the realm of the sciences. So uh, I'm glancing through the list of those honorary fellows already listed. I was intrigued to see that actually a number of those that I would consider to be within the area of the humanities are already included. So I am intrigued as to whether or not this is merely a change within the legislation for the sake of consistency with all of the other definitional changes rather than something that in practice is going to change the types of honorary fellows that we already have. Now, as I was saying before, when glancing through the list of honorary fellows, those contained uh, strictly um, affected by Clause 12, there were a number of those within the sciences that I'm ashamed to admit I wasn't necessarily familiar with. And so again, I put the question to the member. Um, could he explain to me the perceived role of the honorary fellows? Because if it is the promotion of the sciences and of the work of the Royal Society, I'd be really interested in that because um, as someone who I'd like to consider myself fairly engaged, uh, not necessarily strictly in the world of the scientists, but those eminent New Zealanders who are working at the cutting edge, uh, I'd like to see that if that is the role of the honorary fellows, I'd like to see an enhancement of that perhaps, more opportunity for perhaps our honorary Honorary fellows to be present in our schools. Scientists in schools was an excellent program. Small plug from the uh, from us there. Labor Labor government initiative scrapped by National. But perhaps we could put our honorary fellows into our schools as a way of promoting the sciences because we are six in the OECD for sciences when we're at school. But something happens when young New Zealanders exit our our um, uh, uh, our. Uh, education system into the optional education and particularly tertiary. We stop studying science and that's what we need if we are going to be at the cutting at the cutting edge and growing our economy. But just to list off some of the honorary fellows that some of you may be familiar with. I was glancing through and not only James Bellich but Alan Bollard is an honorary fellow. Uh, um, Sally Caswell. Now again, I mean I think that I would see her as dabbling a little bit beyond just strictly the sciences. You'll know that um, she's a public health advocate, works in uh, the alcohol space in particular. David Ferguson, now obviously a bit more of the sciences in there with um, his work on the um, longitudinal studies of growing up in, in New Zealand and has made a lasting uh, contribution from New Zealand's perspective to the world of science. But um, people like um, Paul Callaghan, now, the reason that probably most of the members in this House will know who Sir Paul Callaghan is is because he hasn't just been recognised as a scientist or as an honorary fellow of the Royal Society, but he was recognised as New Zealander of the Year. And I think that that helped enable lift him into the broader public consciousness for us, and that's a fantastic thing, because some of you will be interested to know that he is particularly well-renowned for his nuclear development resonance, his post 
gradient spin echo research, his dynamic NMR microscopy, and his scattering formulization for PGSE NMR, and his PSG ESR in a quasi one dimensional conductor. And yet, if I ask you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, 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 Mr. Chair. I call the Honourable Member. Jacinda Thank you. Ardern. Thank you very much. I think that actually might have been the minister who, who enabled me to take my second call. So enlisting all of those areas that one of the honorary fellows is well renowned for within the science field, I'm, I'm probably quite sure um, that if I ask members in this house that within the science field, what is it that Sir Paul Callaghan has been recognised for, would those areas have been something you would list? the PSG -E ESR in a quasi one dimensional conductor in particular. I have to say that I wasn't aware that in, in, uh, at a, in a global sense his work on nuclear development resonance was something that he's been recognised for. But if I ask members in this house what is it that they recognise this honorary fellow for, what would it be? Well, I think his contribution to the debate on the role of science within New Zealand and within the New Zealand economy. And off the back of having been awarded a, um, the role, uh, the title of New Zealander of the Year, he has embarked on a bit of a roadshow around New Zealand, talking about the fact that, in his view, currently we choose to be poor in New Zealand. And we choose to be poor because we invest in low-wage economy. Now, as an honorary fellow, I think he's seen that his role um, as has been set out by the Royal Society on the website within the legislation is in supporting the activities of the Royal Society. He's become a true promoter in the sci of science as a way to grow New Zealand's economy of us to become a wealthier nation, a nation where we can uh, grab on to the things that New Zealanders are proud of, the idea that we have an entrepreneurial spirit, the idea that we don't have to be the best at everything, but the best at a few small things. Not the best at building health equipment, but the best at building sleep apnea equipment, the kinds of things that if we multiply over a hundred times, suddenly we turn our economy around. Now, as, a, as an honorary fellow, as an honorary fellow, as recognised by the Royal Society, I'm sure that that probably was a starting point for Sir Paul, Paul Callaghan to take on the mantra of not just being the scientist who investigated PSG, -E, ESR and a quasi one dimensional conductor, but took on the role as supporting the activities of the Royal Society as a promoter of their work. Now, I would have liked to have seen in this legislation us embedding the kind of spirit that Sir Paul Callaghan has taken upon himself as an honorary fellow. This idea is a promoter, but also an instigator of other young Kiwis, not only becoming members of the Royal Society and potentially future honorary fellows, but of those who are simply going to become people like Moana Mackey, the professional members of the Royal Society, those who learn the sciences and stay in the sciences in New Zealand for the benefit of all of us, because currently we're losing too many of those potential future honorary fellows. So I'd like the member in the chair to tell me whether or not it was ever considered that we include in the legislation the tasks that an honorary fellow might pick up, the kind of role that they might have, because currently this notion of supporting the activities of the Royal Society is rather vague, and I'd like to see a greater extension of their role um, in New Zealand as promoters of the science, <coughs> given, as Sir Paul Callaghan has pointed out, the enormous contribution that it could make to our future wealth, our income development, our creation of jobs, uh, and not just through things like Labor's R&D um, uh, tax credit, which incentivises the private sector to invest uh, in the sciences, thereby creating jobs for our future honorary fellows, but by promoting New Zealand on a world stage where he is already recognised. And I think that that's something that many of the honorary fellows I've already listed, uh, David Ferguson, Sally Caswell, Sir Paul Callaghan, James Ballard, Alan Bollard, all have some international recognition. So again, is it just supporting the activities domestically or are our honorary fellows, as set out in Clause 12, intended to stand on the global stage 
as uh, almost ambassadors of the Royal Society of New Zealand, demonstrating to the world the huge innovation that we can achieve in New Zealand, despite being a small country, but by taking that passion, uh, that ability that we demonstrate at the primary school and the secondary school level, but really taking it to the global stage and promoting ourselves. That, for me, is the essence of what I would like to see these honorary fellows um, doing. At the moment, we have very confined clauses here, uh, and they, they don't really express, I think, the full potential of the honorary fellow. I'd be interested in the views of the chair. I call the honourable Damien O'Connor.